Welcome to this latest session as part of the Wide Days um, online conference. My name is Chris Cook. I'm the founder and managing director of CMU. We're a London-based company that help people to navigate and understand the music business. And we've been presenting sessions and taking part in sessions at Wide Days for a few years now. Usually we get to be in Edinburgh for that. And we love that. But it's brilliant that this event has been able to go ahead online this year and indeed reach an even wider audience around the world as a result. Some of you may have tuned into my sessions yesterday where we were talking about data stuff. Well, today I'm hosting two sets of sessions as part of the Wide Days program. Um, so at one o'clock, I'm going to switch into a different room and we're going to have two sessions all about music video. But for this next hour, we're looking at the changing role of the good old music distributor. And the fact that music distributors have been evolving their businesses for a number of years now, to the extent that some music distributors now don't like being called music distributors. And so we've had the rise of things like label services, and then in more recent years, something called artist services, which are all kind of different ways of talking about the same thing. And so that's what we're talking about for the next hour with getting the service. And like the sessions I presented yesterday, we're going to begin with a uh, short presentation, a little CMU Insight Speed Briefing. And then once we've done that, we'll then get our guests in and I'll be talking to them about all of these topics and digging quite a bit deeper for the rest of the hour. Now, the presentation, which is just coming up in a moment, all of this is based on a piece of research that we at CMU did with and for the Association of Independent Music over the last 18 months that was then published in late 2019. And that report that is now available, you can go to the AIM website and download a free copy, is called Distribution Revolution. And that report looks at a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about for the next hour. So we're going to begin with this very speedy speed briefing where I just give you the, the top line information you need from that. Like yesterday, for those of you who tuned into my sessions yesterday, um, we are still finding that the video's volume is slightly lower than our microphone's volume. So in order to be able to get the best out of this video, we would encourage you in a moment to turn your, your volumes as high as you can, and then you'll be able to listen to the presentation. And then once the presentation is over, maybe bring it back down before we start talking properly. And then fingers crossed, it will all work. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get the presentation going and then once this is over, we'll get our guests in and we'll delve more deeply onto all of these topics. Um, so here we go, I'm gonna press play. Welcome to this CMU Insights Speedy Speed Briefing on Distribution Revolution in Five Steps. So what is Distribution Revolution? Well. It's a report that was published by the Association of Independent Music and CMU Insights in late 2019, which looks at the way the role of the music distributor has changed and evolved in the streaming age, and at how music distributors are now increasingly working with a wider range of clients and offering a wider range of services. So that some music distributors no longer call themselves music distributors. They prefer terms like label services or artist services. In the report, we look at how distributors work with labels, but also how distributors now sometimes work directly with artists and their management teams, or possibly the producers and studios that they're making music with. It also looks at how rights holders, whether that is a label, large or small, or a self-releasing artist, a single artist label, how they go about picking a distribution partner, what they should be considering, what the challenges and issues are in the way that labels and artists and distributors all work together. We're specifically interested in digital distributors, although the report does also talk about physical distribution as well, because of course, there have been companies that help record labels get their music to market for decades. But the real focus of the report is digital distribution, because if you think about it, in terms of the digital supply chain, what is happening between the artist making music and the fan streaming that music? There are various entities involved in that process. In the report, we identify three key players between the artist and the fan. The rights holder, what we might traditionally call a record label, although that might also be the artist's own label, but the company that is in control of the copyright in the sound recording. Then, of course, on the right hand side, we have the digital music service provider or DSP. So that would be Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, etc. And then in the middle, we have the distribution partner, the company that helps the artist and rights holder get their music to the DSP and to the fan. And it's that distribution partner that this report is focused on. You can download a free copy of the report from the AIM website and from the CMU Insights website. But today, I'm going to talk you through the basics, as I said, in five steps. So here we go. 
step one. Digital services want to license as much content as possible through as few deals as possible. Now, this was certainly true in the early days of digital, when the first digital services started to emerge in the late 1990s and especially in the early 2000s. We had lots of digital startups who needed music. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to access as much music as they could by negotiating licensing deals with as few music companies as possible. Now, initially, that gave an advantage to the major record companies because the major record companies were sitting on vast catalogues of music. So by negotiating a deal with a major record company, a digital service could get an awful lot of recordings and tracks into their system. In the very early days, the majors were resistant to doing those deals, and the indies, as innovators, got there first and initially had an advantage. But once the majors were into digital, then the indies were at a disadvantage because the services were looking to do deals with companies that could bring lots and lots of recordings to the table. In order to meet that challenge, what smaller rights holders, independent labels, started to do was, well, one of two things. Two approaches were identified to overcome this challenge, either aggregation or group bargaining. Aggregation was where other innovators in the market set themselves up as the middle guys in this operation. So the early digital distributors started to emerge. Companies that would sign up lots of labels, combine all of those labels catalogs, and could then go to the streaming service and say, okay, we're not a major record company, but because we are now representing lots of independent labels, we have a significant catalog, you should do a deal. Meanwhile, some indies, particularly in the UK, decided to go through a group bargaining approach. And what they said was, OK, rather than us having a, an entity sitting in the middle, what if we came together and formed a committee and then we negotiated a template deal that all of the members of that committee could participate in? As this slide shows, these two different approaches that organically emerged in the early to mid 2000s have resulted in the two main options for smaller rights holders and independent record companies today in terms of getting your music to digital. You either go the distributor route which is the evolution of aggregation, or you, you join up an organization called Merlin, which is an evolution of group bargaining. Which brings us to point two. Today, as a rights holder, there are two, possibly three ways to get your music onto all the digital music services. Direct deal, Merlin deal, or distributor. Now, a direct deal means going to Spotify, Apple, and Amazon and negotiating a direct deal. But as I say, most streaming services want to get as much content as possible through as few deals as possible. Now, it has to be said, some services, Spotify in particular, does now negotiate with a wider range of rights holders than it did in the early days. But actually, that simple preference of getting as much music as possible from every deal does still stand to an extent. Plus, streaming deals are incredibly complicated. For many small rights holders, the thoughts of negotiating that deal and the legal costs of negotiating that deal, it's not really worth thinking about. So although some independent rights holders do do direct deals, actually the most realistic options, particularly for smaller rights holders and for self-releasing artists, are the two we've already mentioned, the Merlin deal and the distributor deal. The Merlin deal, you join this organization called Merlin. Merlin then negotiates template deals with all the streaming services on your behalf. Once the template deal has been negotiated, you can then opt to join in with that deal. And then you need to find a way of getting your music to the service. Merlin isn't a distributor. It negotiates the deal. It processes the usage and royalty data that comes back from the streaming service. But it's the label's responsibility to actually get the content onto the platform. A distributor also brings a ready-made template deal to the table. But it also gets the content onto the platform. So the distributor is doing something else. That said, in terms of the cut of the money, as you work your way across this slide on a direct deal, there's all the upfront costs of negotiating the deal and the ongoing cost of getting your content onto the platforms, but there's no middle party taking any cut. Merlin charge a nominal percentage, just you know, 3% or less if you're a member of certain trade organizations like AIM, but there is the ongoing cost of getting your music onto the platform. 
A distributor is likely to take a more significant percentage of money as it flows through the system, but as well as bringing deals to the table, which might in some cases actually be a Merlin deal, but other cases, deals they've negotiated themselves, the distributor gets your content onto the platform, but crucially may offer some other services as well. Which brings us to number three. Distributors have greatly expanded the range of services they now offer their clients. So a lot of distributors, if you go to them, they'll say, okay, we can get your content onto the services. We have licensing deals, or maybe we use a Merlin deal, and we have the technology to get your music onto the platforms. That's the aggregation that we talked about previously. But we can do other things too. And most distributors these days, beyond the DIY distributors who offer basic services to everybody for a nominal commission or sometimes for an upfront cost, but then no commission, the higher level distributors almost certainly will be offering sales and B2B marketing services as well, which is helping you build a relationship with the streaming services, to get listed on playlists, to look for other opportunities to partner with the platforms. Plus, they'll probably be helped with data and analytics, processing that data, understanding that data, and doing stuff with that data. But many distributors offer other services too, marketing services, organizing marketing campaigns, PR and promotions, creating all of the content that you now need around any music marketing campaign. And plenty of digital distributors offer other services on top of all of that, direct to fan, physical distribution, catalog and channel management, neighboring rights management, royalty admin, sync, anti-piracy services, plenty of other things that your distributor may bring to the table as part of your distribution deal. Although, a simple fact of business, the more services you take from your distributor, the higher cut they're going to want. So when you come to a distributor today, with most distributors, they can offer you lots of extra services. As I said before, to the point at which they would probably say, we're no longer a distributor, we're a label services company, we're an artist services company. But the simple fact is, the more services you take from your distributor, the bigger cut of the money they're going to want to take. Number four, the other key point here, distributors have expanded their client base so that they now also work directly with artists. Whereas in the olden days, in the main, distributors worked with labels. So artists would sign to a label, which might then be working with a distributor. Whereas what we've seen in the last 10, 15 years is that some artists set up their own label. So they are now both an artist and a label. And then as a label, they, they do a deal with a distributor. And that distributor then provides a whole load of the services that a traditional label would be providing. So the artist's own label, the single artist label, which as the artist's career progresses, probably other people will be involved in running that, in particular artist management. But that single artist label won't be doing everything that a traditional label would do. They get those services from their distribution partner because those extra services are now available. So we've seen distributors both expand the services they offer and also the clients they work with, which creates an interesting dilemma because it now means that from a record label's point of view, your distribution partner, a really important partner that helps you grow and expand and have a successful business, is also now potentially a competitor when it comes to signing up artists to work with. It's an interesting dilemma. Number five, whether you are a single artist label, a small indie label, or one of the biggest indie labels in the world, there are many things to consider when choosing a distribution partner to work with whether it's for a single release or an entire catalogue of recordings. And in the report, we go through lots of different things in more detail that you should be considering and discussing and debating whenever you're looking for a new distribution partner, particularly if you're making a long-term commitment. All of these things on this slide here are explained in more detail in the guide. Which brings us to the plug. If you're interested in all of this, you should download a copy of the guide. You can either go to the AIM website or you can also access it on the CMU website. And lots of work is ongoing in this space on AIM side, plus the market is constantly evolving. So you should stay in touch with those changes by signing up to the CMU bulletins and by checking out AIM on their website, on their social, who will keep you up to date with all the work that they are doing in this space. And there you go, CMU speed briefing, on the distribution revolution. Thank you for listening.
So there you go. That is the quick presentation to get the debate going and give you uh, uh, some insights and information on how the music distribution market has evolved over the last 10, 15 years. So to carry on that debate and to dig a little bit more deeper and to think about what it means for labels, what it means for artists, what it means for managers, etc. Let's bring the panel into the conversation. So uh, their faces are now going to appear. If you haven't already, maybe slightly reduce your volume now we're back into uh slightly higher volume uh kwame's got a very loud voice so uh, get, 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 get your uh, sound adjust. i've got a loud voice too if it's fine for me it'll be fine for kwame um okay let's begin as we usually do by just getting each of our panelists to give a very quick 30 second cv of what you guys do and uh and and you know, the roles that you currently play many of you wear multiple hats um but let's start off by, by getting g to quickly introduce ourselves thanks chris uh, hi, I'm G Davy. I am uh, nominally head of legal and business affairs at the Association of Independent Music, or AIM, as we're otherwise known. Um, I do a whole host of things there, um, but uh, a lot of what I do is based on what I used to do, which is uh, that I used to work in the cooking vinyl group of companies, which uh, included a record label, publisher, and um, a distributor, which at the time was known as Essential Music. Um, and uh, handled a lot of international work and so on. Um, Cooking Vinyl claimed to be uh, one of the first labels to uh, to pioneer artist service agreements. So I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but all of that experience gave me great background for, uh, for working on uh, distribution issues at AIM. And uh, I'll hand over to the next panelist. Yeah, good. A uh, little speedy overview there. So uh, let's come to Kwame next. Um, I'm I'm Kwame Kwarton. Um, I'm a music manager. I have my own management company called Ferocious Talent. But amongst other things, I am also uh, a trustee for the MOBOs. I'm also um, vice chair of the MMF. Um, I also have my own label services company, uh, which releases our acts. Um, and I'm a, a lecturer and mentor at Point Blank. Plus, of course, the other thing, I do the ultimate seminar with Andrea Yule and Nikki Joss. That's me. There we go. L lots of hats being worn there. And uh, let's bring our third a panelist in. So um, hello to Anastasia. Hello, um, I'm Anastasia and I'm a music producer and artist and I have been releasing music by myself as well as working with labels such as Niche Tune, DFA, Sound, and I also run my own label and recently I took on a little project which is a pop-up store, pop-up record store in Nottingham on the name Takeaway Jazz Records. OK, so as you can see, each of our panellists is bringing multiple perspectives to the table, which is always good because it means that actually with three people, we can probably cover about seven different aspects of, of this debate. Um, but I'm going to come to G first. Um, obviously, I did a, a quick overview there of the Distribution Revolution Report. It's an, it's a, it's an AIM report. AIM commissioned it. Um, and it just, I suppose, I... I did the end bit at explaining what the report says and and uh, some of the issues it raised but maybe we should get a little bit of the background as, as to why what was it, 18 months ago when we started working on it maybe a little bit before that actually um you know aim decided that, that this was an area that a decent bit of research should be done and, and, and sort of a, a, a check the lay of the land i guess of, of all things music distribution what was the motivation for the project um, there are a number of things, really. Uh, partly, I suppose, um, myself coming into uh, coming into AIM with a bit of a different perspective and a different background, um, having worked with uh, with distribution. Um, but uh, I think primarily, um, we really just looked at the the changing face of the industry in general. I mean, uh, technology has created a whole host of opportunities um, across the landscape of, of music. Um, we know that it's created opportunities for artists to create in different ways. Um, and it's also changed the face of uh, music business. Um, music businesses now really have a spread of functions, whereas before they were more single function. Um, so back in the day when AIM started, for example, AIM was set up by uh, a group of independent um, record labels. And, and really they were, you know, that, that was the primary focus of their activities. Um, 
But what you find more and more over time is that businesses tend to have a spread of revenue streams and a spread of activity. Um, again, as I say, driven largely by uh, technological changes and opportunities. Um, and I think uh, our CEO, Paul Pacifico, really summed it up to our board when he he uh, he faced them and told them that uh, that he didn't think any of them were really record labels, and they they all looked a bit shocked at him. But um, really, what he was saying was that uh, as many of them were carrying out record label functions, if you like traditional record label functions of releasing music, um, and they were doing a number of other things. Uh, some of them were making as much from their events side of their business as their label side. Some of them had always been a kind of uh, mixture between uh, management and label um, and other functions as well, like, uh, you know, Kwame is a great example of that um, at the moment. But I think that's really been the thrust of it, how much evolution there is in, uh, in the changing functions across music businesses. Um, but with that spread of functions and the different types of business and the different ways of engaging uh, between artist and business, um, it can be really hard to understand that, especially when you're entering music business and really trying to to go from uh, from from you know turning that into a career or into a business structure around you. Um, and it's really important to know what business it is you're getting into, like any business. Um, we looked around at that time and thought there are lots of lots of guides and knowledge out there about um, about digital music evolution, um, about uh, the the ways that streaming has changed the the landscape, um, and to an extent also about uh, record deals and what record labels do. AIM had done a lot of work in that area and, uh, amongst other people, um, but there was very little understanding about what distribution really entailed even it's in its traditional sense um, and even within uh, labels and music businesses but particularly we felt amongst the artist landscape um, there wasn't a good understanding of all the different models available and how distribution looked uh, in the 21st century and how it worked um, and you know knowledge is power so it's it's important to have that um, that was coupled with really the distribution businesses really starting to offering this, starting to offer services directly to artists. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's so important that managers and, and artists understand the options there and understand how to navigate that. And AIM has, as part of its mandate, um, really a, a, a mission to drive knowledge and understanding uh, amongst artists, amongst the public. And to point out, you know, good practice and bad practice wherever it lies and really show people what their options are and demystify the business landscape and business models. Um, I suppose the final the final reason we, we decided to commission it was um, an element of concern, I suppose, about what seemed to be a, a, a speeding up of the consolidation of distribution. So back in the in the dark ages of music, um, there were very, very few labels. Um, and that meant that artists could only really get their music out there by signing to one of those very few labels. Um, and the proliferation of labels, the number of labels there are now, mean that there's lots of options and the range of services means that there's an increase in options. So anytime we start seeing consolidation, uh, we start getting worried that there'll be less choice for artists, less choice for consumers and more control in the hands of very few people. So we don't want to go back to the dark ages of gatekeepers. Um, what we wanted to see was a, a more diverse market with more choice. And we felt that in demystifying the landscape, what we would do is offer artists and consumers the choices of how they interacted with business and keep that range of businesses going. Yeah, that's interesting, that, that latter point that you make there. There was almost uh, two seemingly opposite trends over the last decade, which was we had a number of innovators coming to market as distributors or indeed existing distribution companies relaunching or launching a new division. And it got a little bit complicated because some of those companies didn't call themselves distributors. And then we had label services and artist services or other things as well. Um, and then labels started offering those services or some labels. When you mentioned cooking vinyl very early on, were offering you know, some of those services as well. So on one level, we had more diversity in the market, making it confusing, hence why we wanted to have um, put the spotlight on understanding all of that. Meanwhile, over here, 
the majors are buying all these companies up. So, <laughs> so on one level, we've got more diversity in the market. And then another level, the, the, the major labels distribution division is getting ever bigger, meaning that, that there is actually more choice of models, but less choice of, of partners. So it's an interesting contrast of, of two trends. Um, I'm, I'm going to come to, 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 to Kwame next and, and sort of you know, th these trends that we've just spoken about, the fact that distributors now work with artists as well as labels, the fact that they offer more services, the fact that now as an artist, you can go the traditional route, you can go the major label route, the indie label route, but then there's a number of other routes as well. Um, I mean, on one way, that's hugely empowering for artists and their management teams. But then I think at the same time, there are a number of challenges that, that, that comes with that. So I guess, you know, what, what do you see as, as the pros and the cons of all these changes that we've seen o over the last decade? Ooh, that's a big question. All right, you're gonna have to break that question into <laughs> Give me the third part and I'll do that and then I'll do that because that's a big question. So in, in terms of, you know, as a, as a, as a manager now working with yeah. artists, you have yeah. more choices in terms of what you do with your recordings. Yes. So I guess, what do you see as the positives of, of those more choices? And what do you see as, as the negatives of having more choice? Okay, all right. So positives of having more choice. Right now, you get your recording done. Um, the positives would, okay, I'll, in fact, I'd almost rather start the other way around. I'd always rather start with the negatives. So if we go negatives first, the bar has now significantly been moved, okay? And what happens, I know from a managerial perspective, is that as a result, as a, for a manager, you are asked to do more, okay? So you're asked to do more in order to get to a place where investment can be bestowed upon your good act and yourself. Whereas before, the bar might have been a lot lower. But, uh, you know, um, people might have come in a lot earlier to invest in something that you're doing. Now... So I suppose just, just so there's two things there, again, to, to almost two, two trends that seem to conflict, which is one, it's so much easier to get your music out there as an artist now we have many 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 more artists coming to the table with a recording getting that recording onto the platforms through a distro kid or a ditto or whatever but then the flip side is certainly in the 2000s when the record industry was was having a struggle um, some of those traditional business partners certainly the majors were probably coming to the table with money and support later so as a manager there's more artists wanting your services but it's going to take longer to get the traditional investors on board to help providing that support Totally. And a lot more, as a result, was put, emphasised, put onto managers. Right now, OK, back then, a manager, I would say, what would you say? I would say a manager back then, you'd almost look at somebody who just had the role of bringing together and coordinating people, projects necessary to meet the goals of an artist or a, or a, or a band, and, and that was it. Right now, as a manager, you are... A&R, sometimes agent, because don't forget the bar for agents has moved up as well. Roadie, brands, gifting, you're sorting out. Publishers, you're sorting out. Obviously, you used to do that back then as well. But promoter sometimes, because again, promoters are coming in a lot later. As well. The bar's moved up for everything. You know, you're sourcing songwriters because bar's moved up for publishers as well. You're looking for programmers. You're looking for artwork people. You're looking for radio pluggers. You're looking for event organizers. You're looking for light, lighting. To, you look, the whole thing is upon you to do that because the bar has moved up. So in a way, that can be hard. However, the positives, right, are that, yeah, you do have more choice. I'm in a position, I, I'm talking right now, like literally, I'm in this position right now. I have an act that has a choice of being with, we have six offers come in on this act and they can either go with a major or they can go with label services or they can go with a sort of hybrid of the two or they can go with indies. So when you reach that per place, so the act that I'm talking about has you know, 25, 26 million streams independently. So 
you at that kind of level, people will talk to you and they will kind of go, well, you've proved that you can do it yourself. So that's when it gets good and juicy because you do, you have that many, you've got options and you can quite honestly look at a label services situation that, you know what, it's 70-30, it's in your favour and they're giving you finances and rights reversion is going to be a lot earlier. You know, they're talking about getting your rights back after seven years or five years or, you know what I mean? Uh, and they, you know, as I said, they're, they're funding the operation as well. As opposed to, you know, you're looking at maybe a, a major label deal that is a lot less, you know. So you, you you could at least weigh it up. And and also what it does mean is that if you're if you're looking at a major label now, you can kind of go to them and go, in the words of Janet Jackson, what have you done for me? What can you do for me lately? You know, it's that come on. I mean, if you if 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 you're real. Show me. Don't just tell me that I'm going to be a priority or, I mean, what does that mean anyway? You know, it's that thing of like, really, come on then, mean it. You know, who are your international, right? Who, who get them all to call me. Who's your marketing person? I want to speak to them before I do the record deal, not after. You know, show me the team. You know, you can do all of that now because you've got a pile of deals sat on the other side that go, not necessarily. No, it's interesting. I suppose so. In both of those things, the the the, the downside and the upside. Um, so I suppose the reason why, I mean, the reason why labels, particularly majors, started investing in artists later in the two thousands was because the record industry was in freefall and recorded music was losing value and 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 you know taking that substantial risk. To be fair, yeah, that, totally. that uh, indies and majors make. But can I, can I cut in, Chris? Just oh, just very quickly. Let me say one thing. But but. It was because the DIY distributors has come along and then the beliefs of this world that that because if they didn't exist, labels couldn't have invested later because because you just would have a whole load of artists sitting around doing nothing. But because artists work, we could now expect artists to initially do it themselves and then in partnership with management. That's why it worked with labels coming in later. And as you say, although that means artists and manager have a lot more work to do in those first few years, yeah. when you come to doing the deal, that's when the huge positive kicks in because you have much better negotiating power. And also you just know what you need because you, you have a bit more experience. I'm going to bring G yeah, in and then yeah. I'm going to get Anastasia's experiences. Yeah. G, yeah. go ahead. I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that you were absolutely, the, the point that you're making, I think draws on two aspects. One is um, the kind of the, the fact that you can't replace the expertise you need to, to handle all those different areas. And that's what you're talking about. I think when you're saying that the bar is higher, you, you need to be able to do all those functions and it's yeah. about the choice have you know look, where do you find that expertise it's about having the choice to look for that expertise in different areas i think that's the uh that's the fun thing that's going on right now that's the, that's the good thing and part of part of it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing but i'd say and i, I don't know if you agree with me on this kwame but with that power and with those options comes power right knowledge is power options are power with that power comes responsibility. Um, I'd say that the artists and managers now, you know, you, you have the option to decide how you want the market to look to some extent. Yeah. You have the option of whether you have those conversations with majors, whether you just completely ignore majors and whether yeah. you're know, biased on this, you know, I work with independents. Um, but, you know, and I, I, I believe in working with independents and I believe in a proliferation of the market. And I think, Really, what's happened with this, the distribution revolution for me, is the fact that, that that artists can vote with their feet. You can choose how you get to market. I mean, we'll get onto some stuff about scale, I guess, later. So I'll hold back on that for now. But, you know, in terms of how you initially reach your fans, you have a choice. And you have a choice of whether you want a broad and diverse market, and that means broad and diverse music in the future, or whether you want to hang on to these same old models and trust in those in those same old models. And I think what you're talking about is the choice and the power in that choice, but also the responsibility and the, the, the catch, if you like, in that choice as well. Listen, if you've got an artist right now and you're a manager, the simple truth is, is that artist has to be prepared for a three to four year slog right, with you. And if they can't, if they're like, you know what, I want my stuff out tomorrow and I want it all to be good and I want it to be, honestly, a lot of the time I'm like, 
do you know what? Bye bye. Bye. But that's, that's always been the case, though, hasn't it? I mean, I was I was a manager back in the day, and that's I'd say you know, you even you look at like a, a kind of classic old school old school now indie artist like Block Party. Mm. You know, um, seven years to get the kind of signing that they were looking for, to get the kind of access to market they were looking for. That's six or seven years where they were putting out the odd thing here and there in a very very early DIY way. But that's you know, I think that's standard. I think to an extent, it's always been standard. I think what's changed a little bit is some of the expectations that people yeah. can just get out there and be huge. And well, that, yeah, I, I just want to quickly bring Anastasia in here, as, as someone who's made oh, yeah. these choices, as someone who's both worked with labels and some really good labels and also self-released. And I'm just sort of interested, if you talk about the different projects that you've worked on over the years, um, I mean, was it that you deliberately made a choice with the things you self-released to self-release or was it that you wanted to get those projects to market quickly and rather than waiting around to build momentum for labels to come on board, you decided I'm just going to do it myself? You know, why did you make those um, decisions? And, and then I guess what was the difference between working with an indie label and, and doing it on your own? Just put my mic back on. Uh, this is a very good question. Why I, I yeah, I have experience with both working with labels, uh, such as Neptune, DFA, and a few more, and also small independent labels. And I had experience that was not necessarily pleasant because the contracts were not explained to me. I didn't know I was signing, and actually start getting to know like develop interest myself in music industry, music business. And I must say like this book really helped me to understand like, <laughs> quite, a lot of, quite, a, quite a lot of things, you know, like what kind of deals, like how is it all working? Because a lot of times I ask my friends, colleagues, or, and, you know, the more I start practicing my music, I start getting to know people who are, you know, like a big place of music. And I was like, what is publishing? I'm like, oh, don't ever sign publishing unless there's a big money involved. And there's people telling me like, oh, I got a publishing deal. And I will ask, well, what, what's the financial? Like, oh, I didn't get paid, you know, but we promised to put me in the movies. And I'm like, okay, great. So you're giving away like a lot of your income for promises. And anyway, so it was very interesting to me because I always have access to my fans from SoundCloud. That's how I started. And um, the music I produce, like it, it's electronic music. There's a lot of uh, samples and I always look for some interesting places where I can find samples, but legit samples, <laughs> royalty-free samples. And I came across uh, this website called Lambda, and I've been using the service for, I don't know, like a year, and only purely for samples. And I, could, and I saw the offering mastering, and I saw the offering distribution, and I thought, okay, right now I'm not working with... Uh, bigger labels so you know I, i'm gonna try myself because we all also offered like a free trial to do like a track and i put it on i was like oh wow it's on spotify i didn't know i could actually do it like that and it was very interesting to see and once i got onto that and realizing oh okay so i'm getting all the money because it's all my tracks and i have all the rights to it suddenly i start seeing data like at the back end and i start seeing money coming in and it's like Oh, hold on a sec there's something really in there being independent and releasing and knowing exactly how much money you spend on marketing how much spend, how much money you spend on i don't know mastering or you even got it for free and it's in there and suddenly the tracks are on all the platforms and one of the interesting things will happen to me that really show me that being independent having all your rights is so important or at, there's a big benefit, of course, if there is a label putting money, financial investment, and there's obviously there is a big place for that. But um, I went to a shopping center and uh, I was looking for Greg's Bakery and uh, Argos, and I, I was so inspired. I came home and I made a track on my bed. And when I was like, you know what? I haven't released something for a long time. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to like put a distribution. I, I don't care. Like I, I selected my distributor and I select as soon as possible and I go out live for the next like few days and before I know it I see like a lot of play on a track I and mean, before I know it I see it's being played on BBC Six Music and everywhere and I was like wow that was like fast super fast that's something you see immediately but this was just like kind of DIY artist I don't you know I just do it because it's fun but you realize and hold on there's if you plan things and if you 
start learning about data, you understand marketing, how ads works, and etc. You actually start, you know, you become an, a business. And if you're interested in that, I know a lot of creative artists kind of, oh, I, I don't want to know, I, I, you know, I don't care. But whereas like there's a big market and what you're talking about, how distributors offering now service and yeah, it's very competitive now because there's so much choice and I want to get like, oh, I can get mastering. Yeah, it might be not the mastering you get as, you know, if you paid an engineer and someone who's like a human and like a AI mastering, but still as a DIY artist or common artist, for you to become available on Spotify, this is like platforms really amplifying you and empowering you. And it's suddenly it's like, wow, you know, I know I can do my label, I can sign artists for, I don't know, two, three years and like have very limited amount of money because it's fun and do it together and grow the artist. And it's like, yeah, it's very empowering. And like, in my opinion, I like working with labels because obviously there's financial and there's a bigger promotion. There's a, you know, there's a people who have experience in that, but also being independent. That's like, to me, I was like, this is, this is great. This is amazing. I, I love it. Yeah, so I suppose if you if you are an entrepreneurial artist, not all artists are, but if you are an entrepreneurial artist and you're and you're interested in learning about the business and willing to do that work, then now is probably the greatest time to be an artist. Um, oh, because, and, and it, it comes back to what we've been talking about is just having that choice. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much choice, and it's so exciting because more people are like, oh, how how did you get on radio? I'm just like, well, actually. I didn't pay anyone. I ended up on radio because I just made a track about a sausage roll in my bed. I put it in on Spotify. And now I also get like a bigger label who discovered that track on Spotify commissioned me to do remixes. So it's all, you know, it's very exciting. And you, the more you learn. And yeah, I, I guess I see your point clearly because a lot of artists don't want to deal with this kind of stuff or don't understand. And they only purely want to be creative mind and that's fine i guess like I, i'm more interested in like a business side as well because i just saw it's like oh this this is fun and i love learning about new technologies and uh music business in general so yeah but it's definitely there's a lot of choice and it's a lot of competition yes yeah, so choice and competition and with that the need for education which brings us right back to where g started which is which is the reason why aim was commissioning this because i suppose it's interesting all these different entities we're talking about the distributors the labels the managers who are also labels the artists are also labels actually are all part of the aim community aren't they so, so uh, although in some ways there's a bit of competition going on between these different entities you are representing all of them and they all need this education and information yeah for sure i mean yeah it's, it's really interesting to hear anastasia's journey basically uh, she talks about working with labels um but as she said as well in fact she is she's being her own label Kwame also, you know, running uh, his own label, um, operating label services. I think, you know, what we're really seeing is is the broadening of of uh, of people who who some people who don't even realise that they're labels. We had a a talk by uh, AJ Tracy at our uh, at our event back at the start of the year, Aim Connected, and um, he was talking about the journey that he'd taken with his manager. And how the major label, um, you know, landscape really didn't suit him, and he decided to go it alone. And um, what he slowly unpicked across that presentation was um, really, it was like a realization that went on on stage about the fact that he had become a label. And I think until that day, he hadn't really realized that. So for me, it's back to that same point of uh, the balance between expertise and and choice. Really, it's about you still need all those functions to happen. As Anastasia was saying, you need to be able to make sense of the data so that you can work out how to best release your music. Um, you need to be able to work out the different options that are available and understand what they mean for you, what level of service you're going to get. She was talking about the mastering. You know, uh, Are you going to pay a third-party mastering engineer or are you going to use maybe a lower cost, maybe not quite so good but AI uh, mastering that could apply to any of the expert services that traditional labels um, carry out so you know you've got your PR and your plugging which you know maybe as a if you like a DIY artist as they're known um, you can put something out there and it'll go a certain way it'll reach a certain amount of people you might get a lucky break it might get played on six music or radio one extra or something like that but 
you know, really to, to push it further, what you need is some some real expertise, some depth of expertise. And that's, apart from the money and the financial investment in artists, that's what labels traditionally provided. Now, you know, that that still is out there. That model works. As Anastasia was saying, there's, there's a lot of artists who just want to spend their whole time being creatives. Maybe they don't have a head for data and business and they just don't want to know about that. That's, I think, where they can plug into that more traditional label structure or perhaps pick a, a distributor who also offers uh, what they call either artist services or label services, the two terms are used for, for similar things. Um, but effectively what it means is the distributor is carrying out the services of a label or services to an artist that a label would normally carry out. So, you know, they might be able to offer PR and plugging, they might be able to offer um, synchronization pitching, um, all of these kind of expert areas that if you're an artist working for yourself, you probably can't spread yourself that thin. Um, you might be able to dip in and out and get to a certain way, but to really expand your horizons and expand your fan base, you still need that expertise. And I think what we're talking about is the choice for artists of where they find that expertise, whether they spend their own time becoming a record label themselves or whether they decide to just plug into a record label, um, whether they decide to plug into one of the other types of label services, or whether they choose to hire their own um, third parties. So effectively they act as their own CEO. And uh, rather than do it yourself, they direct it yourself, if you like, and they, they, choose, um, they choose their own uh, you know, expert team around them to do that for them. But effectively all of these things are carrying out these label services, these expert services, which you need to to build a career and really make sure that you're that you're amplifying your music in the best way you can. One other thing to, to quickly ask you specifically, G, I guess, is we, we talked a lot about the impact all of these changes have had on artists and the choices of artists now available, and also the impact it has on managers who are often working in partnership with those artists. But I suppose the, the other half of this report was this this evolution of distribution, this increase of services available from distributors is also very relevant to traditional record companies because many independent record companies traditionally worked with a distributor in the olden days to get CDs into record shops and then once digital happened to get their music into iTunes and then into Spotify. But that bigger list of services is also being offered to those record companies. And that, that one of the, the challenges for those labels is, well, do we take those extra services? or not and and i suppose so, so there is an element of, of labels traditional labels if there is such a thing also having to navigate all these changes in the market yeah absolutely i mean in, in that way they're kind of in the same boat there, there's a, a plethora uh, you know a wide range of uh, of services on offer and again i suppose especially when you talk about labels and independent labels for me that's everything from what kwame and anastasia are doing um, that could be a producer who works with a few other, you know, a few other uh, artists uh, who's releasing music on their behalf. That could be um, a, a three-person or four-person operation. Um, I suppose uh, Scruff of the Neck in Manchester are a, a really good example of that. Um, you know, all the way up to something bigger on the independent label side of things, I suppose, such as uh, Ninja Tune, which Anastasia mentioned, or uh, Beggars. Um, you know, all the way up to the, the big corporations. And all of those, I would say, are, are representations of label in the 21st century. So I suppose I suppose a lot of the impact has been, as you say, there are there are the choices of how who does the services. The services need carrying out by someone. So the label, especially a smaller label, can choose whether um, they're going to carry them out themselves, hire people in, hire an expertise. They can choose to go to third parties, just like an artist can. Effectively, they're in the same boat on that. Or whether they just plug into a distributor. And really, at that point, what you're talking about is that scale um, question again. How do you maximize and amplify your releases, whether you're an artist or a label? And for that kind of scale, you, you need something bigger than yourself. So if you're a small label or a DIY artist, then you need the scale, really, of a distributor who can then aggregate um, or bring all those um, those different clients that they're working with together. And then they, you know, they can get preferential deals from DSPs um, and so on. And that's that's to do with plugging into the scale 
where you don't have it yourself, where you don't have the option of hiring in a whole load of people yourself. And I suppose a really good example of that, again, of, of achieving that scale and being able to um, bring a whole load of uh, people together and, and get some collective power um, is uh, looking at Merlin. So Merlin, as you say, not a distributor, but um, they are a digital licensing agency. So they bring together the power of having so many uh, label and artist clients that they can that they can approach DSPs with that scale and say, hey, we represent all of these people, and to have access to their music, you know, you, you need to negotiate a good deal with us. So, you know, you can also plug into scale in that way. Um, it is worth noting one of the things you didn't mention in your presentation. It's worth making a point of Merlin operate in a particular way, and they're not able to let all artists plug in directly to them. Um, they need you need to be able to have various um, technical systems in place and so on to make sense of the information that Merlin will send back. So it's not suitable really for for most kind of single artist labels to plug in directly. But the way that they can plug into Merlin and the deals that they can do with that collective bargaining power is that they can choose to work with a uh, Merlin distributor member. So um, they'll get the benefit of those deals through their distributor. Um, and of course, then there's distributors, um, even on the independent side, there are independent distributors who have a lot of scale themselves and are able to do some direct deals. So again, we're back to all those, you know, the various options. Um, and just one other point to pick up on as well, Chris, you mentioned about the fact that uh, labels have for some time now been offering more of a distribution model or an artist service model. Um, and that distributors are obviously now offering those services quite often. Um, and, you know, yes, there is there is some obviously some competition uh, elements in that, although in the independent landscape, we tend to find that that competition takes more of a kind of challenge um, face to it than, than any kind of destructive face. Um, you'd be surprised how much information sharing there is across the independent landscape um, and how much generosity there is. Um, but I think I think that the competition is is healthy, and I think most people regard it as healthy as long as the, you know, as long as the, the there's there's enough space for everyone to operate, then that competition leads to people having to put forward more more good practice, best practice, and really trying to define their unique voice in the space. Now we are coming close to the end of our time, and before we finish, I'm going to get each person to offer a, a tip or two, and that can either be for a self-releasing artist or it can be for an independent label, whichever you prefer. But before that, I just want to come and ask one other thing: um, the question of Kwame, and almost I'm asking you a question here with your MMF hat on, because I know this is a conversation that's going on within the management community at the moment. So you mentioned, obviously, within your business, you have a label services side of the business. And part of that is because as your artists are going the distribution route, um, they need more support from you uh, to, to, to take up some of the slack, to bring some of the things that a label would traditionally have brought to the table. And as yeah. G said, it means that your business becomes, yes, it's a management business, but it also looks a bit like a label. That then is a tricky conversation, isn't it? in terms of what is your deal with the artist? Is your deal with the artist a management deal, the classic 20% commission model? Is it a label deal? Is it a combination of both? Nobody can quite decide. And this is very much a conversation going on inside the management community at the moment, I know. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so basically, I suppose it, 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 that can summarise that by saying... Section. As, <laughs> as managers are doing... As managers are going into business with their artists and in essence doing some of the work of a label we then start asking the question, is the classic management 20% commission model fit for purpose, don't we? Yeah, the answer to that is no. <laughs> Putting it simple. I mean, because the simple truth is, is it, you're not doing some of the label's job when you are developing an act. You're doing all of the work of a label to develop an act. You're doing all of it. You're finding the distributor. You're, you're helping out with the artwork. In some instances, you're going into the studio and you're also choosing which artist is going to work with your artist. So you're even getting in at that kind of micro level. So you're not just doing part of it. You know, to me, look, we're in an age now where even politically, it's about calling out people's worth 
and just going, okay, that is what they do. So compensate them for it. You know, the age of kind of, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that idea. I'll take that. Idea. Bye. To me is, 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 is gone because people can just say, do you know what? Actually I did do this. I did do this. I did do this. And I did do that. So to me, that's the follow through of it. Um, a lot of my artists, the kind of deals that I do a lot of the time is, is we're either on an equal split when it comes to the master. So if there's just a solo act and my management company, no matter how many people I have in my management company, my split with the artist will be 50% on the master, right? But as managerially, you don't double dip. What you do is, is that you have your, you know, 20 or sometimes it depends if you've got a solo act and you've got an assistant working then that's a 25 percent deal i do managerially you know because i i just take it that i'm gonna cut off a slice from my managerial end and i'm going to you know make uh, that payment i guess available to to the person that's assisting me. So the way that really I look at it, I don't even look at that in terms of managerial deals. I look at it as music companies now. And I think that really, what are we? We are CBPs, we are creative business partners. And I think that once we start looking at ourselves like that, and we start looking at the model like that, and we start looking at ourselves as music companies, because we don't just, you know, we're not just on the road, or when I say just on the road, because that's even tough, right? We're not just um, negotiating deals, uh, smoking a cigar and rolling up to an award ceremony. I'm not saying that that is all we ever did, but I'm just saying, you know, the typical perception of a manager is always kind of just, or from back in the day anyway, was always a bit kind of like they were expendable. And, and now it's kind of like, no, you know, you look at the... the, the Hello. A hundred percent agree. You're you're yeah. an independent music business. Totally, yeah. Independent oh, yeah. business. That's what we are. Yeah, Our that's... time is, is slipping away and I've got another panel to host, so we have to finish on okay. time, unfortunately. But I might just come back to um Anastasia for a very quick tip for self-releasing artists and then maybe to G for an even quicker tip for labels and then we, we'll wrap it up. But don't forget everybody who's tuning in, my three guests are going to go into a Zoom room immediately after this panel so if there are any other topics that I've failed to bring up then you can go and talk to the panellists directly in the Zoom room. Um, but let, let's come to Anastasia for a quick, what will be your quick 30 second maximum tip for self-releasing artists to, to, to get the most out of all the things we've been talking about today? Okay, one read this book and I, I, I don't know I'm, I'm just I learned so much it's like a bible like a started yeah yeah, yeah. And, and I, I'll, I'll hold up this one as well basically everything I've ever written we're basically saying which is nice isn't it <laughs> very good it, it's very good there's like a lot I had to go through to understand but it's actually suddenly it's like oh wow okay so this is one number two if people don't agree to work with you without contract I mean with contract that's a big red flag like massive red flag and it's very common in electronic music for some reason. And number three, yeah, look at yourself as a music company. It's like, you know, an artist, you are a music company. That's it. And then, G, you've got 20 seconds for a quick tip, maybe for a label audience. Okay, I couldn't agree more. I think my my quick tip goes for everyone. And it's, it's empower yourself. <laughs> knowledge is power. Get some knowledge. Um, read the distribution revolution. Uh, understand the deals and understand your options and then choose your own adventure uh, choose the future of the music industry and vote with your feet and, and i did like the, the the line you came up with halfway through which i'm going to steal which is diy doesn't mean do it yourself it means direct it yourself i like that line so i'm gonna i'm gonna adopt that and use that yeah. and finally my final point is come and support independent music because that's where all the fun is at the independent music awards um on the 12th of august and uh, hopefully see you there there you go. One last little plug from AIM. Uh, everything I've done has been plugged already. Thank you very much to my guests for plugging all of the work that we've done. We've got to wrap up now because I've got to go do this other panel and my panellists have got to go into the Zoom room to answer your questions. But thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you found this discussion really interesting. Lots of interesting insights there. 